I thought it was important to start with the kind of introductory work, because I know, Wowie, you put so much thought into um, really the pacing of the exhibition, what people will see, how the different photographs talk to each other. Um, and certainly this really, you know, you're starting with this very stunning, fiery red image. Mm -hmm. um, so much of the work is also about self-portraits, but it is and it isn't. And mm -hmm. so I think maybe that's a good way we can start, talk about yeah. what, what is happening in terms of self-portraiture. I thought it would be a bold claim to be standing in front of the street. Who is this woman? She's not from here. She's brown. She's not a man. She's an artist. In that position, I'm claiming that hole that's been missing in art history. And at least, you know, um, for the future um, creators, artists, women would see that there was this woman who has braved that genre of self portraiture that seems to be fraught with a lot of doubt and a lot of. Um, questions about value, about um, how the self is going to be enthroned in that, is that vanity? Or is it something more deep as we are all creatures of symbols because we are all creatures of meaning? And in our life, if we are all being honest here, the first question we want to ask is, who am I? And what is that I? Is that body? Is that something inside? Or is that how you appear? Because we all have that kind of multi-dimensionality. And in my work, I'm here after a career of 25 years behind me. And it's my first exhibition in New York. It's not a retrospective. It's a comprehensive um, collection from 2019 to 2023, which attempts to illustrate, show, and embody a cycle of transformation that happens in the life of an artist who is a woman, who is a transnational, who is a nation, who is all of that. The other shore is a reference to where I'm from, the Philippines, which is archipelagic, and there's always that vantage point of looking beyond. What is there on the other side? What is the other shore? Is that, of course, being in, in the States, the land of opportunity, the foreign workers, the uh, overseas Filipino workers, we always had that in our families. Every family would have a person who is abroad. But not just a physical place, I would want to propose that kind of interior, exterior, the other shore. And in my work, this kind of uh, dual nature of things, the doubleness of things, seem to, la seem to vacillate. And there's no um, beginning or end within it. Which but I would also say in that sense, like the idea of self-portraiture, it's like it's you and not you at the yeah, same time. No, I'm very detached to the, to the work, to be honest. Yeah. This image comes from that time where I had a fire in my studio. 2016, I had a fire. So I didn't have a studio for two years. I was shooting marble, big landscapes outside, trying to come to terms with, with that force that seems to you know, remind me about what, what is it to create if you don't have, um, if you lose things, if you lose uh, the, the space. material, the space. Yeah. So this marks the year zero of 2019 after the fire in which I finally had a studio again and I have brought all the materials and I would create in this way uh, what I do with the tableaus and the mise-en-scene that I collage in the studio spoke about how art history is so important, mm -hmm. symbolism is so important. I know that you're thinking about Goya's Duchess of Alba, which I is see. in the Hispanic society. If you want to talk a little bit about where some of that comes yeah. from. Bueno, uh, yeah. So this image, after many years I've made this, I look at it and I, 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 I'll say, I see this somewhere. I don't know. I don't remember. Did I make it or was it already in existence in my head or something? And then I came across this um, work called uh, La Duquesa de Alba by Goya. And I remember, I've probably seen it when I was living in Spain. Then it seems the whole image of the past and the present collided. And the uh, shared histories of the Philippines and Spain and Latin America all coalesced in that, that kind of imagery. And that happens many times in my works, this, this kind of echoing. 
And I think there's, I spent a little time, you know, thinking about that painting and relation and the conversation we're having here. And the interesting thing is, you know, that painting's also famous for what's kind of written in the ground. Goya puts yeah. in, it says solo Goya, so only Goya. Thinking about his relationship to the subject. I think that idea of the artist and subject is so important to your work because you're both. You know, so yeah. in a sense, like all of your work is like solo wowie because you're the maker <laughs> and the subject. Thank and you, in yes. relation to that painting, yeah. I think it's really interesting of what that dynamic yeah. and the be. coded messages in the paintings is something that I feel that's both playful and also profound. And it depends. I notice that my works change depending on the place it's shown. Like here, it's in New York, but if it's shown in Singapore, it's different because they know the kris, the sword that is very Southeast Asian. And then the fabric, there's Tinalak from the south of the Philippines. And it comes alive in different ways. When she's holding and pointing down, in, in the Goya painting, she's doing this with a finger. And it's solo Goya at the bottom. And then her ring has the name Alba, meaning like maybe talking to Goya, the painter, that solo, this is me and you. And me, with the audience, I have that relation. Because these are things that I know that this has happened to you. I don't know you, you don't know me in that sense, but I know this is happening to you. And she's carrying a cigarette with fire. Do you use the same thing that used to hurt you, that used to destroy my studio, and there's a fire in that cigarette? So do we allow fear to, to stop us from creating? So those things. In a full circle. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, we maybe just give a rough sense of your thinking around this whole room because there's oh. a number of themes and you're organizing it in a yes. very deliberate way. The opposites are always something that has been interesting because I always find myself in between. Being a maker of images and also the one that's looking to it. So being both the dreamer who looks within, that's her lying down, and then the maker who is actively creating the image, gathering materials, using technique, deriving all of these like, intellectual and intuitive references, put in one. This piece particularly is based on a work by a national artist of the Philippines. His name is Federico Alquas. What I do in my work sometimes is I reinvent or recreate art historical works and propose a rethinking of how it is if it was a female who did it. Because how we look at ourselves and how the intentionality of it and being fully aware of what I'm doing is important. And then on the other frame, there's a confrontation of the artist as woman and the artist woman as mother. And in that space, they seem to have a private conversation. Some people think, is that a before and after? Before you're a mom and cool and fun, and then, and then you become a mother, and then you're like a subdued version of your older self. But I think it's not the case. It exists in the same plane, and they, and they oscillate from each other. And then the whole exhibition has a lot to do about that, about creation as an act of making artworks and creation as continuing a lineage of, um, of uh, us. Yeah. And yeah. keeping that in balance too, yeah. right? And the stones there from Pacific and Atlantic, from both ends of the world, if, if I may say so, the thing for me is not about dichotomy, it's about integration of these opposites. When I expose my interior worlds through something exterior as photographs, when I combine them, then that's where magic happens. So this wall, I finally celebrated through my birthday cakes. When I gave birth, I gave birth to my son, but I also gave birth to another aspect of myself. And that happens not just with me, everyone here has been rebirthed many times over. And this was after the pandemic, so everyone needs to have a cake and have a reason to celebrate and have joy in art. Because art is a place that we also kind of draw from our affirmations of life and that we're all still here. So it's very important to introduce that through the materials and the color. This wall is a lot to do about the cycles, the reproduction, not just bodily reproduction, but also reproduction in photography and also the transitions and the different 
seasons that a woman has in her life, you know, because women's cycles from birth to the very end, it's like a continuous rebirth. Yeah, maybe that's a good way to turn towards process, yeah. to think about how these are constructed. I think one of the interesting things is like when you step back, you're getting this very vibrant, coherent composition. When you get closer, you're realizing you're seeing the Photoshop layers. Some things don't line up. You're seeing elements literally taped and pinned. Like it's kind of very evident how they're being yes. made. It's a, a nod to the DIY of my culture. It's like. That's how we make innovations, actually. It's very creative. Um, that's the autoconstruction, like the you create as you go. People think that I've cut and put things in post. But most of this, everything is in studio. It's a collage that I made through the set. So from the flooring to the background to the foreground and to whatever you see, it's, it's there physically. But just to mess with the viewers, because we're talking about photography. Why do we always have this attached to the hip relation with photography and authentic depiction of reality when something that I would want to show has nothing to do with um, documenting a slice of time, but my interpretation of my own reality. Sometimes just to add another layer of complexity, I would cut it in Photoshop. And there are anomalies, in, imperfect, and sometimes really obvious. The thing with photography, before we arrive at one image, we've probably had a thousand. And they're all reproducing with the same thing. And then if you could take one, like this, um, this is Todo Lo Que Tengo. It's about being vessels, it's about uh, the matrilineal passage of time. And when I was living in Istanbul, it's Anatolia and all the ancient world, even before culture, it, there's the vessel that seems to be a repeating material all across. I wanted to depict it all at once, like from the, from the pottery to the plastic gallon of mineral water, and then the ibrik, which is usually brass, is now a blue plastic, and of course indicative of where I was, which is in, in Turkey, in Istanbul, this one. So I, I wanted that layering also of time. So there's always a reason why there would be something of a, of a glitch or a riddle or an anomaly, but there's always a reason why it's there. Which also echoes the title in terms of how much you could carry, right? And like the mo kind of doubling of the hands and that almost kind of impossibility of And it. the titles are also the keys in which to enter and then sometimes it switches between languages as well. So when I'm making this, it's, it's like I'm writing, it, it feels like a lexicon, a vocabulary. So it's also another way to approach it. It's not very literal, but, but, but yeah, there's, there's some code switching that happens depending on what material is being shown. Which maybe is a nice way to yeah. speak to the central image around the song of Rosa's Pandan. Well, this is the, uh, the latest work of 2023. And she's all been traveling. The, the, what you see here is 2019 in Manila, 2022, 2021 in Istanbul, all across during the pandemic. And here we culminate with this uh, latest work. And it's called Rosa Spandan. And she is taken from a folk song in Visaya, in the Philippines, in a dialect that my mom, um, well, we know, I know it from her house, but of course, growing up, I always thought folk songs or thing of the past are also corny. I don't want to do anything with it, you know, like, like how it is with post-colonial countries, I think. Like, we don't want to be caught with this unsophisticated provincial, provincial things. And I just started to explore things that I used to be ashamed about. And that's how I unlearned a lot of things. The colors here before, I didn't like color in my work. There was the time that I was just doing monochrome and colors were gaudy and tacky and all of that because I'm educated in the West. When I came to understanding my practice, it's an unlearning process for me. So the colors that I used to didn't like, now I like it. And in fact, I use it with much fervor and strength. And the same way as folk songs used to be something that's not to be celebrated and put out in a contemporary art show. So 
I put it her I put her here because the song is uh, who knows how to speak Bisaya here. No, nobody from Bisaya from Bisaya <laughs> from the Philippines. Uh, yeah, so Cebuano, and it says this Rosas Fandan came from uh, the province, from the mountains, from the Bukid, and she came to town for a town fiesta so she could sing and dance a very old song. And because she was so beautiful, all the men and the boys were drooling. That's the whole song. There's nothing deep about the song. There's no redemption of whatever that was. So uh, I said, okay, that's it, that's a song. And then I researched more on this, and I found out that that song in local dialect was sang all over the world, from Moscow, Budapest, Latin America, Korea, Kuala Lumpur, different people singing that dialect, singing about Rosas Pandan. So eventually this provincial girl is in fact now a transnational. She's been everywhere. Indai has been everywhere. And to me, I added another layer is when I came back, she comes back with all the experiences of, of these cyclic changes and transformations. In the end, she comes to her own self-determination. That's Rosas Pandan. Another layer of it is also the use of decorations in this uh, upcycled plastic, which is from bottles of soft drinks. So that's another way to reinvigorate. One thing doesn't end with one thing. We can always transform it. And the celebration of women's work in my tableaus are very important because for a long time, it's been relegated to secondary in the arts, embroidery, lace, basketry, textiles, and um, weaving. So it's all part of the lexicon because it's also very important to bring it back to the now. This is a, a heritage textile from the Philippines called the Patajong. These are, were done by the community of women in Leyte. It's like that, the intersection of different things. The crochet and everything is there. The material history is important for me. So when I'm making the photographs, I feel that sometimes it's just flat and it ends with the, the, the glass. And the viewer, I wanted them to have a direct experience of the material. So I extend the fabric further. Every step of the creation process, from the studio, to the post, to the printing, to the frame, I wanted to put myself in it. So this wall basically charts the time when I was turning 40 and I was an artist. I was thinking, can artists have kids? Maybe I had something of an inkling and then I remembered my, my professor, my masters, in our class asked him, can you give us tips how to succeed in the art world? I said, okay, I got tips for you. One, you should have a name before you're 40. Second, if you're a woman, decide if you're gonna be a mother or a serious artist. And we're mo mostly women. <laughs> and they were, we were all depressed after that class because it's like, okay, so is that the only way? So at 40, I was thinking about that kind of idea of nature, fertility. 2019, I was pregnant. 2020, I gave birth. And that was the time I also moved to Istanbul. So back to zero. So something of that identity shift coming from an artist to a mother. And that was like a very cloudy cave time. And I was really remembering that maybe my, my professor was, in fact, very honest because the email stopped, no one's calling, it's crickets, it's a foreign land, it's pandemic. This exhibition answered my question because the answer to it all was, my return to art is my return to myself. And that when I did my work, everything again flowed naturally. 
I think it's very important to speak about it, even if it's it's not just personal, but it's, it's something very real in, in the art world because a lot of women artists encounter this. On that wall is about the artist as transnational, the artist who has been in different places and has accumulated things and also thinking of how identity is shaped and memories of home inform it as well. Whenever I go, there's some kind of acculturation that happens because in Anatolia, like I said, the, the ancient world was very much uh, part of everyday life. It was Constantinople, it was Byzantium, it was all of this that was so amazing to me. And one of the images that I saw was this Oran's gesture, early Christian or pre-Christian, you hold your hands to the sky, bringing the heavens to earth. But that time, 2021, I also saw on TV, Heidelin Diaz, a Filipino athlete, wins the first gold of the Olympics on a category of weightlifting. <laughs> and in my mind, it was the Oran's gesture. And it was kind of like the past, present collided and then I, and I said, this is, has to be in this image, like a flash, a vision. And here she has a ribbon, and we know that the ribbon is an award, blue ribbon. So it seems very light. I was thinking of this invisible labor, women carrying the weight of society, and we think that it's light, but it's actually very heavy. And she's almost like it was expected of her to do that. So it's both that kind of power and strength, but it's also surrender. So it's, it's a surrender through knowing your own power inside, like an inner, inner strength. There's like a sense of grace too under yes. the pressure. Yeah. Yes. And in my work, I always see women as um, dignified. I see it in my mother, I see it in my friends, I see it in the women that I meet. All of them has this kind of like gazing in the front of the camera, almost like a Byzantine icon, like straight and and also like very Catholic stuff, pitas, the saints. To me, it's all part of it. It's all part of the... But it's not just one thing, which also speaks to that like syncretic idea that you're coming to yes. with the work, right? It's not just a particular saint or it's not just the wrestler, but it encompasses all of this at the same yes, time. Yes, and it's also, it pulls all of the... Um, memories of the Philippines, because Philippines is, is a lot to do with boxing, beauty pageants, Catholicism, fiesta, food, uh, colors. It's just, it pulls in all of this. And when you said syncretism, it's, it's a very important word to think about uh, Filipinos and, and our identity. In fact, it's, uh, in my work, I, have a, I call it tropical gothic. And Nick Joaquin, our National Artist for Literature, also has a suite of works called the Tropical Gothic because it's a very special pastiche that was a mix between this Baroque Catholic hangover meets Southeast Asian sweaty, humid, mixed with drama from, you know, it's very fertile in that it's, it's only distinctly Filipino. We're just Latin in Asia. We're, we're that kind of special pastiche. And it's evolving because we're also bringing, well, the Americans. A lot of the American is in the Filipino as well. It's a pastiche, it's a, it's a hodgepodge. And the horror vacui, the muchness, the overly maximal, it's that desire to have all of it all at once at the same time. So I have many brujas in, in this <laughs> And I finally decided, yes, you know what? Bruja is not a... Uh, what do you call it? The, 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 something that's negative? Mm -hmm. It's not to me. It's, it's actually very accurate because what I do is no, no different from the Babaylans of pre-colonial Philippines. And Babaylan is, um, before we were colonized by the Spanish, we had a whole societal structure and it was the woman at the center of it as a seer, a healer, medicine woman who knows nature and the plants and and basically brings some from the world of ideas into reality, like what an artist does, basically. So La Bruja here seems to recall to mind the Odalisque, the favorite of artists from Matisse to Juan Luna. And I lived in Turkey, in Istanbul, where the Odalisque is from. Well, the Odalisque literally means like a lady in the, in the, in the room. 
so here she's surrounded by all these cleaning materials and the subtitle all the places she's been and of course she's filipina the first question they ask are you a domestic helper are you a this are you a that because the identity is always attached to it right so in here i don't give an answer but i propose that it's not something to be ashamed about here is she the cleaner or is this her house is she or the list or she's actually reclining Buddha from the East and I realized she's reclining Buddha because there's this again the power in the beingness you know she doesn't need to do much she's just present in looking at you and on the fabrics all tell you where she's been and also the material history of textile itself we have here Dutch block prints but it's also Indonesian which is also now very popular in Africa so how, how does that, you know, tell of the world that we live in, right? So there's a lot of uh, movement and exchange. Yeah, so that's the La Bruja. This is like my parting shot to the viewers. So again, the textiles, right? So I'm questioning, could we create something of a structure from a fluid form? In a way that is asking, would a river shape the land through its soft curves? It's just this opposites again, right? The hard and soft, the, the deep and the shallow and all that. Here in the end, I celebrate the body, the female body, because at the very end of the day, that's the Novus Mundus. That's everyone's entry into the world. She's the source and vessel created through time, but there's a resistance that's, that's there. There's power in it, there's beauty, there's form. But in the end, I also want to say that because the title is very indicative, it's called Pretty Savage. Savage has been called, um, you know, when, to refer to, when, what's that, the, the colonies of, when we were colonized, mm -hmm. the natives were always called savage, unsophisticated, uh, all of that. So I'm turning it around here and say, yes, savage is wild. And wild is not out of control. It means you're closest to nature. And if a woman is wild, if a woman is savage, then she is free. So freedom is my parting shot.